um, just sort of writing up all of the stuff that we've got so far that, that we've been talking about quite a bit. Um, the, the world and sort of the top half of the, of the diagram represents how your brain encodes information, which is converting stuff in the world into some action potentials. Um, and then the bottom part is how you decode, which is converting those action potentials into some guesses about what's out in the world, um, which we call perceptions. Um, and so everything in black is sort of like what's going to happen in a brain when the brain goes from stimuli coming in to creating a perception. Um, and then those perceptions might also lead to actions. Um, and we're not really following that all the way to, out to actions. But we did describe in the last unit with visual system how um, once your visual system begins to process things, um, like that exam question where I had, uh, where my kid threw a ball at me and I like made the movement to catch it. Um, not only does there, is there perception that goes on through the parietal lobe and the wear pathway and knowing how things are moving and so on, but then also um, that translates, that, that information gets transferred to the motor cortex in the frontal lobes um, where I can then make the movement that I need to. Um, so we're not going all the way as far as movement, but the next step in this would be movement. We're just sort of trying to figure out the, the sort of how we get from stuff in the world to a perception. Um, and so what we've been talking about so far with the Leach paper and a couple other um, examples like the, um, like the housefly uh, example is we let the animal um, detect what goes on and then we figure out um, if um, how how well we, we, we take those action potentials that we record, so this is uh, so this error represents a recording of those action potentials. Um, we take those action potentials that we record electrically in the animal's nervous system, and then we um, give either the entire set of data that we've recorded from that neuron to a computer, which is sort of a complete timing list, a list of every action potential and every time that it happened or we give the computer parts of that information. Maybe we just tell it how many spikes, but we don't tell it, um, but we don't tell it um, when they occurred. Or we tell it how long it was between, uh, between when the stimulus was presented and the first spike happened, which we call the latency. Or we can say the time between the first spike and the second spike, which is something that we didn't talk about with the Leach paper, but that was the other measurement they used, the first inter interfiring rate. Um, those are all, so those are all sort of different kinds of information that we can give our computer. And then the question that we ask is um, sort of, I guess, two questions. So question one is what info source uh, or sources, I guess, uh, are best? Um, and for that one, um, when we talked about the Leach paper uh, yesterday, um, it was pretty clear um, that um, that the, oops, that is the wrong paper, uh, this one. It was pretty clear that um, the latency information here is very um, precise and, and gives you a low noise measurement that the nervous system, that, that a computer can use. And if the nervous system is sensitive to that, then it could also use it. Um, whereas the, the rate information is a pretty noisy measurement that the nervous system could use, but it's not going to be quite as, um, quite as useful for the nervous system. Um, and in fact, if we take a computer and we give it just the, t the number of spikes, um, which is one of the, the which is sort of the, the rate-based decoder that they use, then that, um, then that computer can tell with some precision where the animal was touched, but the, the error of that is about 14 degrees um, uh, around the body wall. Um, and as you would expect from looking at these graphs, if instead of giving the computer the um, number of spikes, we just tell it the time of the first spike, not the time of every spike, because that's for sure going to be better, but we just tell it the time of that first spike. And just telling it the time of that first spike, it does better than if you tell it just the rate. Um, and so that tells us that on an when the animal does the encoding, that encoding is more precise when, or, or the, the, more, the more precise um, feature that is present in the spikes that are generated by the animal is timing or latency. Um, and even just, just the latency of that first spike, even if you don't know how many other spikes there were or when they happened, that's going to give you a better estimate of where the animal was touched. And so the stuff over there in blue, 
this stuff here is all happening in a computer, and, um, and the timing information, um, latency and timing-based information are better sources of information. Um, the second question we can ask then is um, we can ask what, uh, what information does the animal use? Oops. And here, um, as one of the groups pointed out yesterday, um, we can get a hint of an answer, but we're not totally sure what's going on. Um, so we've, we're pretty confident that we, we're very confident that we've built our classifier so that it is doing the best that it possibly can given whatever information inputs we give it. So the things in red are the information that we're telling the computer um, at a particular, uh, a particular trial. And then the computer needs to guess what's out there. Um, and so, uh, and so it may, what, what we can be sure of is that rate only is not what the, what the animal is using. Um, because our ideal classifier does worse than the animal if we, if we give it rate only. So the animal must be using something else beyond that. Um, then the next, uh, the, the, then the next possibility is it's using some mix of rate and timing. And, uh, or, or just using just latency timing based information, but it's just not as efficient. Um, and so that's the other possibility. Maybe it's, maybe it's not as good as our ideal classifier. In fact, it would be kind of surprising if it were as good as, as, a, as a perfect classifier is. Um, and so, uh, and so that's sort of where we left off last time. Um, so, and so to get at this, um, I actually want to stop talking about the leech for a minute, talk about a different study, and then we'll come back and talk about the leech experiment and follow up to that. Um, but, before, oops, but before I do that, um, what questions do people have left over from the idea here, the ideas from yesterday, that, we're, um, that, that we are letting the animal do the encoding, we're letting a computer do the decoding, so we're trying to understand what's going on in terms of encoding when the animal does it, and these sort of conclusions that we came to. What questions do people have about that? Okay, um, all right, so we're gonna um, switch studies a little bit for a moment um, to talk about um, something that is closer to humans, um, that we're talking about now, um, and I think uh, macaque monkeys, um, uh, which are which are s sort of like cat-sized primates or you know, medium dog-sized primates, um, and they're they're a common organism that's studied, uh, and uh, they're they're uh, closer to humans evolutionarily and um, and neurophysiologically and, and neuroanatomically than uh, than a leech obviously is, or even than a rat. Um, and so what, what um, uh, the experiment that was done by Rinolfo Romo um, and, uh, and uh, people in his lab um, was to train a monkey. So the monkey's um, got its two fingers, its, its um, pointer and middle finger, um, touching a little disc. And the disc is going to start to vibrate. And, um, and the disc... Uh, vibrates once, then it pauses, then it vibrates again, and then it pauses. Um, and sometimes the first vibration is higher frequency than the second, and sometimes the second vibration is higher frequency than the first. And so if the first vibration is higher frequency than the monkey with its other hand pushes button number one, and if the, monkey, if the second vibration is higher frequency then the monkey uses its other hand to push button number two, and if it, used, if, it, if it does that correctly then it gets a little reward. If it messes up and, um, and it pushes and it, and it, and it incorrectly um, guesses what was um, done, then, uh, then, we, um, then, then it doesn't get a reward and it gets a little, uh, it gets a little five second break before it can try the task again. Uh, and, so, and so it's kind of frustrated that it can't you know, try again to get a reward. Um, and so what we're going to do then is, just like with the leech, we were able to measure 
its, um, its perception or infer its perception based on what part of its body it moved when we touched it. Um, here, now with this case, we can make a guess about what the monkey perceives to be the higher frequency stimulus based on which button it pushes. Um, and while we're doing all of this, we have an electrode recording from some neurons in the somatosensory cortex that are receiving input from the pachinian corpuscles out in the periphery. Um, and remember, the pachinian corpuscles are sensitive to vibration. Um, and, uh, and in fact, both the pachinian corpuscles out in the skin and also the neurons in the monkey's brain will typically fire one action potential every um, every cycle of the stimulus. Oops. So if um, so if our stimulus is vibrating like this, then um, the neuron will typically fire once every every cycle like this. If our stimulus instead is vibrating a little bit more slowly, then our neuron will fire like this. Um, so that's sort of the, the arrangement here. Um, and then, OK, so any questions about that setup so far, what we're doing, how the monkey's doing the test, anything like that? Um, OK, so um, if, if we do this, actually, I think, let's see. Let's, let's make this the same time window. Yeah, maybe one more cycle here. Okay. So if we do this. Um, there are two sort of, in a sense, redundant measures if the nervous system is working perfectly. So in this time window, when there's a high frequency stimulus, your, um, your number of action potentials, that is to say your rate, is five here per whatever unit time and three here per whatever unit time. Um, and you can also... Um, you could say, you could give a computer, and so we're going to be feeding this all to an artificial classifier in a minute. Um, so one thing we could do is just tell our artificial classifier five spikes or three spikes, whatever we saw in that neuron. The other thing that we could tell our computer is we could tell the computer um, the time of every spike. But that would be kind of cheating, because for sure that's going to do really well. Um, and so another measure, um, we could do the latency to the first spike, but actually those are pretty, pretty much the same, because the vibration always starts at the same time. Um, and so instead what they do is they look for every one of these. And they say, what is the time between each of these spikes? And so if this stimulus is coming at, t uh, at 30, um, the, the stimulus is coming at 30 hertz, meaning our vibration is vibrating up down 30 times per second. Then um, since, this, since the neuron fires every, um, every uh, um, cycle, then this is going to be um, about 33 milliseconds. This one might be 34 milliseconds. This one might be 32 milliseconds, 33 milliseconds, something like that. Um, and so what we can do, we could tell it all of that, but that's cheating because then it knows how many. Um, instead, we just say, OK, well, what's the median? And we'll see in a second why we do that. But the median um, uh, interval, so the median of all of the intervals. And so that would be maybe 33 milliseconds here. Um, and then over here. Um, with this, the, is with, with two numbers, the median is, is the same as the mean, but that's going to work out to be, so let's say this, is, this one's coming at uh, 20 hertz. So now our median, maybe this one's 52 and this one's 50, so our median is uh, 51 milliseconds. And so, those, so, so one, one set of experiments we're going to give the computer number of spikes, and another set of experiments we're going to give it um, we're going to give it the, 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 inter, the median interval between spikes. So that seems a little silly if the nervous system is completely reliable. But in fact, actually here, oh. I'm going to modify this ever so slightly, another 33 milliseconds, just so that we can 
um, get one more cycle in there so we can sort of see what's going to happen. Okay, so it, these two are going to be pretty much redundant with each other if the nervous system is, is completely reliable. But the nervous system mess, messes up sometimes. Our sensors are not perfect. So, um, if, uh, if the nervous system messes up and drops an action potential, then all of a sudden this measure becomes 65 milliseconds. But if you look, our median interval doesn't actually change when that happens. But, so when we, when we drop an action potential, when the nervous system misses a cycle, our rate's going to drop, but our median stays pretty constant. Um, and alternatively, if instead of dropping an action potential, we get a little double action potential here, now we've got one more number in our set that's like maybe three milliseconds. The 65 is gone. And now, so when we add an action potential, our rate goes up to seven, but again, the median is pretty insensitive to that. It's going to still hover right around 33 milliseconds because we're ignoring these sort of the, the, narrow, the narrow intervals and the long intervals. Um, okay, so does, what questions do people have about that? So um, the idea is that as the nervous system makes mistakes, some, sometimes it's, and actually, the, you can also have situations where the mistakes do alter the median firing rate without altering this. So, for example, if the nervous system drops an action potential here and picks up an action potential there, then that could affect the median while leaving, while leaving the rate alone. So if we drop and add, then our rate would stay constant, but our median might change. So, so in some cases, we're going to get misleading information out of the median number. In some cases, we're going to get misleading information out of the rate number. Um, if everything were working perfectly, they would be, they would be um, interchangeable measures with each other because our time window or time duration is constant. And, so, and you can actually see that here. So for example, there's actually always a couple at the beginning, but if you ignore this first cycle, then um, on this top trial, we sort of dropped one here, dropped one there. Um, on this uh, next trial, we had three extras here, but then we also dropped a couple here. So our rate on the second trial would be con constant, but our, interfiring, but our median um, uh, interval is going be, um, to be off on that second trial. Um, and so, uh, and so uh, looking across trials, you can see examples of cases where you maybe drop and add, in which case the rate is your better measure, or maybe you just drop a couple and don't add any to replace it, in which case the median interval is going to be um, the, the better measure. So, yeah, so what questions do people have about that? Okay, so if we were doing this, what question would you ask? We've got all this data. We record what's going on. Let's say we're not yet actually going to pay attention to what the monkey does, what the monkey perceives. We just have all of this data. And we want to know um, something about this. By the way, this, this median, the inter because this is interval is a timing measure, this is a sort of timing-based measure. So this one's a, a number is a rate, and then uh, interval, the interval measure is a timing-based measure. And so what might you want to know um, just with this? You know the stimulus. You know how the neurons re respond to it, but we don't, we, don't, we don't haven't yet even looked at what the monkey does in this situation. So what, what could you find out from this? Sure, yeah. Compare the two. Com compare the two in what way? How long, how, yeah, how long they lasted? Um, and so, like, what, what would you want to find out from that? I mean, I guess, like, if it's the median, then it's going to kind of be in the middle to the other time, and they're going to kind of reflect around it. So if you have 
problems can be also kind of create some more rapid mm-hmm. firing of problems that have a lot of time around that median. Right. Um, right. And so, yeah. And so, so C sort of like, okay, so, so we can just say sort of which one's a more reliable source of information. Kind of like, um, kind of like this first part here, you know, which one is, is the median, like which one's on average has more spread to it? Is that sort of what you're thinking? Uh, yeah, also just like, the t- like if you're trying to figure out which stimulus it is. Which, well, so both of them are going on in the nervous system, right? Um, cause there's, cause there are action potentials and they have distance between them and they also have, a n- and there's a number to them. Um, but so you want, but you want to figure out maybe which stimulus it is that the monkey's using or that's, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if we want to know which stimulus it is that the monkey's using, then we are going to have to start looking at the monkey's behavior. But there's actually another question that we can ask even before we look at the monkey's behavior, um, uh, which is sort of the, related to question number one up there. Which is the information source is the best? Which one's the more reliable thing? So even without looking at the monkey's behavior, we can do the analogy to this, where we say, is latency more reliable? Is, is, is interspire interval more reliable? Or is, um, is rate more reliable? Which is a more, less noisy um, measure? Um, and very much like um, what was found in the leech and, what, uh, and, and along the lines of what we saw with the housefly, um, what they found is that um, if you look at um, so median interval, interval um, is, uh, is a better information source. Than um, uh, than the um, uh, than than the number of action potentials. So it's a more reliable information source. If if um, you want your computer to do the best it can at decoding this, then your computer will do better if you give it the one number of median fi- interval than if you give it the number of total number of spikes. That makes sense, kind of analog- analogous to the leech. And that's in most of the examples that I showed, the median was more resistant to small mistakes that the nervous system makes. So that hopefully kind of makes some intuitive sense. Um, okay, so, so they did that. Um, and then, then you could ask something like what, what uh, Thompson and Croissant asked with the leech, which is to say, just on average, how well does the animal do? Um, And that's a totally reasonable question. But instead of asking on average how well the animal did, um, they asked a slightly more sophisticated question in this study. Um, And the question they asked in this study was, on an individual trial by trial basis, when did the animal mess up? Um, So, and so there are a couple of options, right? Um, Let me leave that up so we can sort of see it, but I'll draw them up here. Um, So uh, most of the time the animal gets it right because it's really good at this. But when the animal makes an error, um, what happened on those cases? You sort of do a post-mortem analysis on those cases. What happened when the animal makes an error? Um, and so when the animal makes an error, um, did that happen? They sort of, they sort of say, okay, um, like uh, trial number one, um, we say we've got three things that we're measuring. We've got our rate classifier. We've got our timing classifier. Actually, I'm going to get rid of this so that we can see better because I don't think we need that. Our, that, our timing, that is uh, median interval classifier. Those are both different computer classifiers. And then we've also got what the animal does. And so maybe on trial number, uh, in trial number one, the rate classifier gets it right, this guy gets it right, animal gets it right. Okay, not telling us very much. Next time around, um, the rate-based classifier messes up, the timing-based classifier gets it right, and the animal messes up. Next time around, 
uh, maybe this time our rate classifier gets it right, our timing classifier gets it wrong, and the animal gets it right. And then the next time around, maybe on this one, this guy, this one gets it right, this one gets it right, this one gets it right. Then on the next one, again, our rate classifier messes up. This one gets it right, this one gets it right. Um, and to go on and on like that. Um, on an individual, one trial by trial basis. And what they observed when they did that is that even though the best classifier that you can do is to do timing based, the one, um, you know, again, maybe the same thing happens again here. So, um, so this one is scoring, uh, what is it, five out of six. This one is scoring three out of six. And this one's scoring three out of six. So on average, this is the better classifier. Or sorry, this is the, the timing one's the better classifier. But on an individual case-by-case -case basis, when the animal messes up, it's not because the timing was messed up. It's because something happened with our rate measurement, with our number, with our total number of action potentials measurement. Um, and so what that tells you, or what that sort of indicates is now, we're starting to sort of probe into this idea of what, how is the animal decoding it. We haven't actually manipulated externally the timing and rate of action potentials, um, but we have let nature do an experiment for us where on, sometimes, uh, on some events um, naturally the rate is messed up, on other events naturally the timing gets messed up, and then we just see which correlates with which. Um, so that's sort of the, the um, and so it's, it's, it's not a perfect experiment, but it indicates for us that it seems like the animal's brain is more using the rate information and kind of ignoring this timing information. It would be better if it actually listened to the timing, but it seems to be sort of ignoring that. When the timing makes a mistake, it does, the animal doesn't, doesn't make that same mistake. It it's just seems to be following whatever the rate is, is doing. So yeah, so what questions do people have about that? That's that's a, can be a fairly challenging concept to sort of think about. But we're starting to let the animal do the decoding, and then we're going to see on a case by case basis what what happened that, that caused that. Questions about that? Um, okay, so just to um, to show ri written up um, what I said. Um, so there are two possible coding. Actually, they consider like six possible coding strategies, but I'm simplifying this. Um, two coding strategies they considered, median time interval between spikes um, and average firing rate across the whole stimulus. Um, and their, their, um, their purely theoretical analysis showed that the median interval is best. Um, it makes the fewest mistakes. But if you want to make a prediction, not about if you not if you don't want to, not if you want to do the best, but if you want to predict what the animal is going to actually do, then what you should be looking at is firing rate. Um, and so that sort of hints that the animal is using firing rate as its um, as its uh, source of information. Okay. So what questions do people have about that? Um, okay, so we're going to go back now, return to this Thompson and Criston paper here, because there's a second experiment that was like really super brilliant that they did here. I think so anyway. Um, actually, full disclosure, I know them personally too, so I'm a little biased, but anyway, I still think it was a cool experiment. Um, uh, okay, so so far what we, sort of backing up to the leech paper, so far what they did is they recorded and then they fed it to a computer. They, they compared that to the animal kind of like the, the monkey experiment just did. Um, but because in this leech case, we only have two sensory neurons, and we can put wires in both of them, we can put little electrodes in both of them, we can actually do um, a slightly different experiment, which is to take the, take the external sensors completely out 
Here, I'm going to draw this in a different color. So we just cut the world, cut the sensors out of the, the experiment. We're not even going to do anything with the world. We're not even going to touch the animal at all. Instead, what we do is we take our electrodes and we artificially, so here these neurons, uh, pressure ventral left and pressure ventral right, um, we are artificially with our electrodes going to um, insert action potentials into these sensory neurons. And so I can, doing that, I can have a situation where in one case um, I have identical latency, but, oops, but different count. So that would be if um, PVL, so they both initially fire at the same time, but then this one fires more and this one fires less. So there we have forced the timing to be the same, but now we have um, varied the number of spikes. Or I can, I can, since I completely control the action potentials and when they happen, I can have identical count, but different latency. And so if I do that, then maybe PVL fires four spikes starting here, and PVR fires four spikes that start just a, just a touch later like that. So now same, same number, same, same average rate, different, num different, um, different latency. We already know from the first part of the paper that if the animal was using the best possible mechanism of, of classifying, that it would listen to latency and ignore timing. The question is, what does the animal actually do? And so this is sort of summarized in here. So, um, and really actually summarized kind of best down here. So this is now what we're doing. We call this now a decoding experiment. And in this decoding experiment, the reason we call it a decoding experiment is we're not letting the animal do any encoding. We artificially are encoding, and then we, walk, we, we feed these action potentials in, and we watch the behavior the animal makes to see um, how, how much we have to vary the latency before the animal makes a, makes a change. Um, so in other words, uh, like our artificial classifier, a two millisecond change in latency, it would, it would detect that. Does the animal detect a two millisecond change in latency, or is it less sensitive? Um, and our artificial classifier would detect, um, would, would detect a change in rate, but it would pay less attention to that because that's a noisier measurement. Does the animal pay attention to the rate? How much attention does it get? And so what this sort of final little table of four numbers does is it, for the two different measurements, on the top row, when we do the encoding and let our computer, when we let the animal encode and our computer decodes, how precise is the latency decoder? How precise is the rate decoder? And that's actually exactly just those measurements here. Four and 13 degrees. So that's how good our computer can be when we give it those information. That's just, this is just repeating what we saw on that, on that curvy plot from before. The, the bottom here is summarizing the end result from this second experiment where we feed the action potentials in. So, so we're sort of doing the encoding and we let the animal do the decoding. Um, and so the question is, which of those, what is, what is the animal paying the most attention to? So again, we're sort of back at this question. Um, what information does the animal use? Um, or a, a slightly different version of this is, what information does the animal prioritize 
or use most? So that's the question to discuss. You've got the paper. Somebody, somebody in each group has the papers back. Um, you can read through and discuss it. The main result is what's in that, that chart up there. Um, but try and figure out like, what's the animal prioritizing and how can you sort of make that inference based on the data here. And so we'll spend six minutes or so talking about that. Um, you can either write down on the same piece of paper you used from yesterday, which I also handed back, or a new piece of paper, um, what your answer is for that question. might remember that from the final exam. Um, the, uh, we're actually going to talk about that in class today, so, um, so that would, that's something to add to your study guide okay. then for everybody as we, as we get through that. Um, so, uh, I mean, <laughs> you might not remember it very well because you only had like 20 minutes to look at it in the final exam, so but we'll talk about it in class. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I guess let me see. Was there yeah, I think it's version of. Uh, okay, so so what um, what what do people think is going on here? What's our uh, how, what is the animal prioritizing in terms of infor in terms of information sources, and how is it responding to these different sources of information? Uh, sure, yeah. It's prioritizing the count overly. It's prioritizing, okay, so it's prioritizing the count. Um, and so why do you think that? Uh, because it's more sensitive to changes in degrees of count. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, and in fact, it's really not only more sensitive, right? So, so again, smaller numbers over there mean, mean better sensitivity. Um, but it's not only more sensitive, um, it's basically as good as an ideal system can possibly get. Um, the, the best classifier in the universe, um, when you vary the count, will, um, will, do, will have a precision of 13 degrees. When the only variable that you change for the animal um, on the input is count, then it um, responds to that with a precision of 14 degrees, which is only ever so slightly worse than the best classifier in the universe. So the animal has really optimized its ability to detect changes in count. Um, what about latency? How is the animal using latency? Is it not at all, a little bit? What's that? Yeah, so it is encoding with latency. That's true. Um, but, um, but what about on the decoding side? So is, is the animal sensitive to changes in latency? Does it, does it have effects at all? Sure, yeah. On the side here, it talks kind of how latency is used to more like touch localization. Yeah, um, so... Yeah, so latency is... It's sort of a... It's sort of, it is an additional source of information. So if the animal had been ignoring latency entirely, then there would be no sensitivity. It would be unmeasurable. It would be infinite, since infinite um, um, failure and precision. So when you vary latency and keep count constant, the animal does respond differently, but it doesn't respond. Um, uh, but it doesn't respond nearly as well as it could. Um, if it were really good at, det at detecting latency, then it would um, be precise. It would be really precise in what it does. Um, and so the animal prioritizes count a little, a little latency sensitivity. And there's also other aspects too. Maybe it's insensitive to the timing between different spikes and so on and so forth that it might be sensitive to. When the animal has everything to go on, so in a natural situation, um, 
if you touch in two different spots, the latency, if you the latency is going to be different depending on where you touch. The rate is going to be different. The interval between spikes is going to be different. So in the natural situation where all of those things are variable, then the animal does sort of collectively pay attention to all of them. Um, so this little, the reason that the animal does better than, um, than a pure timing decoder is that it's not only paying attention to timing. It's just that, or sorry, pure, sorry, the animal is better than pure rate decoder. It's not, because it's not only paying attention to rate, it's prioritizing rate, um, but then it's also sort of paying a little bit of attention to these other sources to do a little bit better. Um, and so, so, we can, so then we can say based on that, that back to what we said yesterday, it's a mix, it's not using latency only, but it's actually a mix where rate, it's super, super sensitive to rate. And timing, yeah, it's aware of it. It does respond to changes in timing. It's an extra source of information that helps it improve its performance. But it's not, um, but that's not the main thing that it's attending to. Its brain is designed to detect changes in rate. Um, and, and it's aware of latency, but only sort of partially. And so then the overall conclusion from this is sort of that like the ideal algorithm for a nervous system to use would be a timing-based algorithm. What the animal uses is more of a mix that weights heavily rate and pays some attention to timing. Does that all sort of make sense? You have a question? Or? Well, I, I actually do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I'm a little, this is kind of interesting. But, yeah. Uh, so is latency something that like while encoding like something that contributes to the way it's encoded, or is it just like a property of the encoding? Yeah, um, that's a that's actually a really good question. And um, so, I mean, another way another way to phrase that, or another another sort of angle to take on that question, is to say, why the heck does the animal have such precise latency on the input? if it's ignoring all of that. Um, and I don't know a full answer to that, but um, one possibility is that, um, latent, is that because you've touched the animal over here, it, the, the input is just going to arrive a little bit sooner or, that, or the neuron that's, that's receptive more to this size is gonna reach action potential threshold a little bit faster. And so latency happens and it sort of has to happen because of the way the neurons are, are built. And it actually doesn't, the animal's not make, using energy to make latency happen. It just sort of does happen. Um, and then, uh, but then the rest of the nervous system doesn't detect it. Um, and in fact, maybe it's hard to detect. Maybe it's easy to, maybe it's actually easy for neurons to differ in their, their latency just by the architecture of the way they're structured. But um, if you think back to in, in unit one, when we were talking about neurons and how they respond to inputs, they respond to inputs by excitation adding on top of itself. And so if two different inputs arrive three milliseconds off from each other, that might not make that much difference. But if there's five inputs versus four inputs, that might affect whether or not this, this next neuron responds. And so it's, um, it's maybe, it may be that the animal doesn't even work to encode latency. It just kind of happens by accident that this happens. Does, is that sort of what you had, you had in mind? Yeah, yeah. OK, other questions about that? OK. so. We'll, Come back over here. One more paper that we're going to talk about. Uh, I want to introduce a little bit, and then we're going to spend probably 20 minutes giving you a chance to read through and discuss it. Um, so this is um, actually before I do that, um, uh, sort of announcement slash reminder. Um, the final exam, two hours uh, around the corner in in uh, 5403. Um, it started at 8.30 if you want, you can start at 9 if you want. If you want to sleep in and start at 9.30, that's fine. You get two hours to do it. Um, and uh, I'll be there sort of all day, because um, my other class also has, uh, has a final. Um, uh, and then after you're done with the, the, the in-class part, the take-home part for the final, um, and that is another two-hour block that you can do whenever you want, but you, need to, you, have to, you have until midnight to do it, so you should get yourself all prepared for everything. Um, in the take-home part, what I'm going to do is give you printouts of, some paper, uh, of one or two papers you've already seen in the class and a new paper that you haven't seen. 
Um, last spring, when I did this, um, the new paper that they hadn't seen was this one. Um, so this is actually kind of an opportunity to practice as well for that. Um, when it comes time for our final, you should know this well enough that you can answer questions about it because we've already talked about it. Um, but, uh, but that's sort of a, a, a way to think about this. So last spring, we had talked about the, the Romo paper with monkeys, spent a lot of time like we just did on the leech paper, and then moved on to discuss, uh, and, then, and then moved on to discuss motor control, um, which is your homework for the weekend, by the way. Um, but, uh, but this year, we're actually going to work through the paper that they had as their surprise paper for in class uh, for, for the final exam. Um, and so in this experiment, um, this is done by, uh, by Sheila Nirenberg, um, who's, um, one, who's uh, one of the, the uh, most influential people in terms of um, um, thinking about nervous system encoding and decoding. Um, and uh, in this experiment, they've got a mouse that is, um, they plop it down in some water and, uh, and they put a little bit of milk in the water so the animal can't see under the surface. Uh, and then the mouse has to swim straight and then it gets to a point um, close to, there's the, so the, the choice line isn't a thing that the mouse sees, but this vertical line is, is like a wall. And so when the animal gets up to, close to the wall, there are some monitors um, that, that display a visual image. Um, and one monitor will have vertical lines and the other monitor will have horizontal lines. Um, and so, and the animal's task, and, and so what they've got is they've got hidden on one side of this water is a platform and the animal wants to find the platform, it doesn't like swimming. And so, um, and so it, what it's going to see, there are two monitors, um, and one of them has vertical lines, and one of them has horizontal lines, and the one with vertical lines is the, uh, is the spot where there's platform. So it, has, so it would have to go, it would have to turn left toward that one. Um, and so that's what the animal's been trained to do. Um, and then they start to change the task a little bit, or they make it harder. Um, so um, in one situation, they have big, fat vertical lines. They're really easy to see. And that's low spatial frequency. So how many lines across the visual field? Um, so, um, and so that's really easy to see. Then the next time they do it, the same, the same task, but instead of really fat vertical lines, there's a whole bunch of really thin, narrow vertical lines that all squish together. And so this is high spatial frequency, which is the harder task to do. Um, and it gets harder because as the lines get narrower and narrower, they're sort of alternating black-white, alternating black-white. As the lines get narrower and narrower, at some point you get to the point that your visual system just can't detect the lines anymore, and the screen just looks like a uniform field of gray. Um, and, so, uh, and so they're assessing, first of all, how well the animal does in these different conditions. And so um, when the spatial frequency is low and the task is easy, the animal is right 100% of the time. It's figured out what to do, it's right 100% of the time. As the spatial frequency starts to get higher, then the animal starts to make some mistakes. And when you get to a high enough spatial frequency, so these lines are squished together so much that it just looks like a uniform field of gray, then the animals perform at chance. They're just guessing left or right. They can't, the, the visual stimulus is useless to them. So that's sort of the experimental setup, part one of the experimental setup. Any questions about that? So they figure out sort of how the animal responds to different um, different difficulties. This is the average across all the animals. These are individual animals um, and how each of them performed. Part two of the experimental setup, oh, they don't even show the data, they just describe it. Um, part two of the experimental setup is they record from the retina of the animal um, and 
uh, and record um, action potentials, action potential patterns um, for various spatial frequencies of input. And then what they're going to do is kind of like the encoding experiment from the Leach paper, they are going to tell their computer what the animal's retina saw or what the animal's brain got in terms of inputs from the retina. So they're letting the retina do the encoding and in the first experiment here, the animal's retina does the encoding and then its brain does the decoding. In the second experiment, the, um, the animal's retina still does the encoding but then they have a computer do the decoding. Um, and their question is, by comparing these different possible decoders, what is, um, first of all, sort of like what is the best decoder? Um, and they have three that they look at. They have one that's rate based um, and then two that are timing. Uh, timing, a, timing A and timing B. And we're not going to worry so much about the distinction between the two timing uh, ones for, the, for today. And then the second question is what does the animal use? And, um, and in sort of a sub-question to this is sort of a methodology. How do we know? Okay, so that's sort of the, that's the setup for this. Um, what questions do people have before I pass out the papers and you start discussing them? Okay, so yeah, we'll I'll I'll be walking around as you discuss it. Oh, and just um, one other note: uh, the the summary data. For all of this, oh, there's the retina experiment that they did. Um, the summary data for all of this is here, um, in this uh, figure two right here. Um, that's uh, the steps. They're not putting spikes into the animal's brain. So, yeah. How's it going? Are you about done with? Okay. What do you think? Okay. Well, that's well, well, okay. So, uh, I think let's, let's. It sounds like most of the groups are seeming to be close to done. So let's. Um, Let's talk about the, the results here. Um, so uh, here, let me clear this, clear some space out for myself. Question one, which is better? Which is our better decoder? Oh, the timing. timing, yeah, the timing-based decoders. The two different versions of a timing-based decoder are both better than the animal, or sorry, better than the, better than the rate, better than the rate. Um, so, so yeah, so we've got so that's that's um, the ideal classifier for what uh, for what the animal could could use. Um, one sort of comment I'll make right now, and we'll return to maybe in a couple minutes. Um, the it's possible that a timing-based decoder might be better than the animal. There's this issue that we're facing here where the animal's performance for most of this is so good that we aren't, um, that, that it's sort of maxed out. And so you can't get better than 100%. And so, um, and so it's possible that the, that the animal might actually be a little worse than a timing-based decoder, um, and our measurement just can't detect that because we've maxed out our, our reading. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's like if you take a thermometer that goes from uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit to, um, to uh, 200 degrees Fahrenheit and you put it on the sun, then you're not going to be able to tell whether the sun with that thermometer is hotter um, at point A or point B because the whole thing's maxed out. Um, and so it's possible that, um, that point A, the animal, is, not, is maybe not as good as our, as our temporal correlation, but because we're sort of so close to the top, it's hard to distinguish that.
Um, okay, but anyway, nonetheless, timing is definitely, just in terms of comparing classifiers and not even worry about the animal, timing is definitely beating out right. All right, question two. What's the animal using? Um, so what's, what, what's the animal using? Yeah. Yeah, and so is the animals actually maybe even, I mean, I think the error, within, within the error of their measurement, within the precision of the measurement, the animal's actually indistinguishable from the red line. So, um, but definitely some timing, possibly even more than, possibly more than timing, possibly a mix of timing plus something else, X. Um, the, the, pos the possibility of rate only, that one we can cross off. Definitely not using just rate as a classifier. Um, and so how do we know that? Well, uh, so, so Jack sort of got at that a little bit. Um, the animal's definitely beating the rate code, right? So, they, so, so that's how we know that. Um, so um, yeah, I guess, so, so other observations or questions about, about the conclusions here? Yeah. Uh, so, were the uh, animals trained before? Yeah, the animals got really good at this before they started okay. making these measurements. So, yeah. what frequency were they trained at? Was they were trained at a lot of different frequencies. Okay. Yeah, they, were, they, they, got, they got to practice with a lot of different frequencies. And so the limitation isn't like, oh my gosh, it's this new frequency, I don't know what to do with it. The limitation is really like, my visual system just can't tell the difference between these two things. Um, No, so I, I think what I'm concerned about is like the difference between an animal dealing with like a range of frequencies versus a computer just sort of understanding. I don't know. Yeah, so, so again, I mean, we sort of skipped over the math, but they used, again, a classifier that um, is, is as good as you can get based on the information available. So, and so, I mean, one of, the, one of the core pieces of logic for why we can rule out rate is that we've got an ideal, perfect rate-based decoder that, we're, that, we're, that is our computer. And if the animal beats that, then, then um, it can't beat it because it's better at interpreting rate than our computer is. The computer is as good at interpreting rate as anything in the universe can be. Um, so the animal, if it beats it, the computer, must be because the computer wasn't given enough information, wasn't given as much as the animal. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, okay, so for the last uh, eight, seven, for the next maybe six minutes or so, um, I want to come back to the Thompson paper and compare the results here in H, um, where they had um, compared the animal with their rate and timing-based decoders, and look at that in comparison. Oh, and conveniently enough, they use blue and red, the same, um, that's nice, um, and black. Uh, so, so, and compare that with figure two over here. And the question is sort of, what, um, what are either, what, how, to what extent are these similar or different from each other in terms of the conclusions that we draw? So do we draw the same conclusion from, from the comparing animal with the two decoders in the Thompson paper? Do we draw a different conclusion? Um, and how does that, um, and how does that all, all play out? And so that's sort of the last question is, so compare them, compare the conclusions, and compare the way we can sort of draw our conclusions between those. Um, and so we'll have five minutes to do that, write down some answers on that, and then we'll discuss it together as a group. Okay, so um, so what's uh, how, how do these two studies compare in terms of their 
data um, mostly, and as well as also, I guess, their conclusions. But, but first, in terms of the data, so in the Thompson paper, um, is the animal s same as rate, better than rate? How's it doing with the, compared to the rate? Decoder. Huh? Yeah, the animal's beating rate over here. Um, over in this paper, what we just talked about, same thing, the animal's beating rate. Um, and so that means that rate for both of them um, what, was the, what was the sentence at the end of the, the, the abstract, the last sentence about more rich? When, when, uh, somebody was just... Our results show that standard coarse coding, spike count coding is insufficient. Find more information rate codes are necessary. Yeah so, more, so, yeah, so rate is insufficient to account for the animal. And actually both groups exactly come to that conclusion. Um, and, uh, and, and, and their data basically match up with that. Um, how about for the timing code? How does that compare to the animal here versus in the other one? And they're both pretty close to each other. Yeah, so the, here, I mean, the, the animal's falling short of timing in Thompson's experiment. Here, the animal's pretty much matching timing. Um, that may be because we've sort of reached a max out, a maximum uh, possibility here, and maybe on a slightly harder task for the animal, it would, the timing code would beat it. Can't be sure, because they're sort of within, within the, the precision of the measurement of each other. Um, but uh, you know, here, we came to the conclusion that, that already that, yeah, the animal has to be using, well, before we talked about today, from yesterday, we came to the conclusion that the animal is either using timing and a little bit sloppy about it, or is using a mix of timing and rate over here. With the, with the new paper from today, we're coming up with the idea that it's probably some mix of timing and something else, probably timing and rate. Um, so to that extent, they're sort of the same. Um, but the, the, um, just sort of because there are not two neurons here, they can't do the decoding experiment that the Thompson group did. So the Thompson group really had the nice, the nice capability to do this decoding experiment where they fed spikes into the brain that had differences in rate or differences in timing. And there they were able to actually say, wow, the brain is paying more attention to rate than timing. That might be going on here too. We don't know. They in the paper, if you read the whole thing and it's up on Blackboard, their, their main conclusion is that timing is the story. But it's, a, it's, it's hard to know for sure because we haven't done the full, we didn't do this part two experiment in the mouse. And so we don't know if that's a difference between mouse and leech or if that's just, um, just the, the uh, just, you know, um, because of what we've, what we've, uh, what, what sort of the measurements that we've been able to make. Um, and then also like one other paper that seemed to argue once again that rate is what's really going on in terms of the animal's decoding system. For a monkey, it seemed like the rate was the decoder. This is not as clear an inference to make because they're not manipulating rate and timing. They're just looking at correlations between how the animal performs versus how the, the two different decoders perform. And that's not um, guaranteed to give you um, a, the, same, the same inference capability that you can get by manipulating rate and timing as the Thompson study did. But this correlation also points to the idea that rate may be more important than timing to a brain as a decoder. Um, and so there really is still some, some this, is, this is sort of giving you a hint about some of the debate that's going on about, you know, is it rate, is it timing, what's the encoding, what's the decoding. And so that's sort of, that's, that's kind of the, the, the last point about this unit. Um, next week we're going to start up talking about the motor system. There's a homework that you should have to do. Um, it involves watching some videos and answer, answering some questions. Um, and so all of that's due on Monday. Uh, and so I'll see you on Monday to start up talking about the motor system.